is a timely, relevant, and important conversation. It's timely because any day we are going to be hearing back from the Supreme Court on a decision about the citizenship question, which will have a profound impact on the census, as well as some of the hardest to count populations in our community. It's relevant as it's become a national discussion. And as you see, we have a room full of community representatives, interested donors, and public sector partners wanting to support and engage in this effort. And it's important because there is a decade's worth of data, decisions, democracy, and dollars at stake with the census. Today is the first of a series of three events we're hosting to help engage, educate, and inform folks on how to best support and invest in the census and ensuring that this is a vibrant community for all folks. My role here at Seattle Foundation is a managing director of policy and civic engagement. As part of that, I have been the head of our census work since it got started, as well as responsible for the launch of the Regional Census Fund in partnership with the City of Seattle, King County Government, the City of Bellevue, and the City of Kirkland. I know a number of those representatives in the room right now, and I just want to thank them for their partnership and support in this process. In coordination, tomorrow we'll be announcing $700,000 in grants supporting works of our community-based partners to support outreach around the census. This partnership and coordination wouldn't be possible without groups on the ground who have trust, relationship, and deep knowledge of community participants. If you represent a community-based organization supporting work around the census, whether staff, volunteer, or board member, could you please raise your hand? We are really excited to have our governor here to speak and share some of his wisdom about running the census and what we need to look for. But I encourage you to recall those folks that raise their hands. They have very deep and personal knowledge of what it's like to work with communities that face barriers to participating in the census, that have fear of speaking out and can speak effectively around what's happening and what their work needs to look like. So after our presentation, after the conversation, I encourage you to find one of those folks and have a conversation with them about the work that they're doing on the ground. All of Seattle Foundation's work around the census is part of our Catalyzing Community Impact Strategy. Critical work that has been done in partnership and informed by our community partners, as well as championed by our board and executive leadership team. I'm now gonna hand it over to my CEO, Tony Mestris, to talk a little bit about Seattle Foundation's work around the census and launch us into this conversation. Great, thank you, thank you, Erin. Um, here, here. Let me just uh, begin by giving a little context as to why this is so critical for Seattle Foundation, the philanthropists that we support and our mission. Our mission to ignite powerful rewarding philanthropy to make greater Seattle, our region, a stronger, more vibrant community for all. And so the last two words of that mission, for all, is, uh, is really a North Star for us and so many of the philanthropists that we work with. And uh, that really begins first and foremost when you think about the type of change that we're all trying to, uh, to uh, manifest in our community with a fair, accurate, and inclusive count of all of the people of our community. And to that end, what you see uh, is that Seattle Foundation, along with a whole bunch of other really important partners in the philanthropic sector, are really leaning in to try to do the things with our community partners to, uh, to make that a reality. And we're proud of the partnership we have with Philanthropy Northwest, with City of Seattle, with King County, uh, around our uh, regional census fund, which we can talk about uh, more later, uh, as well as other cities in the region that are joining that effort. Uh, and most importantly, doing that with community-based organizations that represent uh, the people who are most likely to potentially be not counted uh, and to not be included in this uh, in this endeavor. For Seattle Foundation, the, the pillars of that mission also include a real focus on an equitable economy, a resilient environment, both built and natural, and then importantly for this conversation, a just democracy. And then I would also say that it's uh, a really uh, important and uh, a an highly strategic opportunity for us to have in our community a leader who ha is sort of incomparable nationally in terms of giving us guidance. Uh, governor Locke, uh, in addition to having been governor of the state of Washington and county executive, uh, was also the uh, Secretary of Commerce and led the 2010 uh, census, which was the most accurate census in census history, counting 
uh, accurately counting 95% of the uh, households in the country. And he has uh, tremendous insight into all elements of this effort. So we're very, very excited to have you hear from him today. And also is uh, leading the, uh, the count effort for the state, for the governor, uh, giving us all great counsel and strategic guidance and leadership as we endeavor to make sure that this pays off for our people in our democracy the way it was intended to. Uh, so with that, I will turn to the governor and sort of ask a, a, a first question about educating us all around the census. This is something that many people just think of as counting people, but in many ways it is uh, about shaping power more so than ever. And perhaps you could just give us a little bit of your perspective on that. Thank you. Well, first of all, thank you to the Seattle Foundation, to you, Tony, for hosting this event and, and uh, helping people really understand the importance of a fair and accurate census. Uh, first of all, um, federal dollars flow to states and jurisdictions based on the count of people. And uh, the, I think uh, as of a few years ago, it was basically $2,300 per person flowed into the state of Washington. So for all those who are involved in philanthropy, focusing on homeless issues, early education, uh, mental health issues, uh, 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 nutrition programs, and et cetera, et cetera. If you want our philanthropy dollars to go farther, we need to make sure that we're getting our fair share of government funds and really the philanthropic dollars are supplementing uh, that and really uh, filling in some of the gaps. So the more that we can actually get money that's due to us in the first place, uh, the better and more effective the philanthropic dollars that follow. It is about dollars. Uh, and uh, then the states receive that money, and then using the census, they'll distribute that back out to local communities. So if, you, if Seattle or South King County wants to get its fair share of dollars, it has to have an accurate count because the state will use that data from the uh, most recent census in distributing whatever federal funds it gets. Uh, but those federal funds are in the billions and billions of dollars for highway, road construction, for Head Start programs, for nutrition programs, homeless, uh, uh, programs, uh, uh, school lunch programs, and the list goes on and on. But it's also about political empowerment, and it's become uh, even more controversial and more important given the uh, proposed uh, citizenship question uh, that's uh, going to be on the 2020 uh, census. Um, it's political empowerment because we use the results of the each decennial census to allocate seats in Congress. The number of seats in Congress is fixed. The number of seats for the Washington State Legislature is fixed. And so if Iowa has more bigger population, grows substantially compared to the rest of the country, Iowa could gain an extra seat in the Congress at the expense of a state in which population growth has either gone down or has been very, very slow. In the last uh, census, the 2010 census, the state of Washington picked up one extra seat. It's possible with the huge growth that we're, we've experienced in the Puget Sound area in the state of Washington, we could pick up another seat, giving us 11 seats in Congress. That, of course, comes at the expense of some other state. And that's why the states are so uh, involved and so jealous of the count and so um, uh, involved. Uh, the citizenship question uh, is now uh, before us, and it, uh, we hope to have a Supreme Court decision perhaps tomorrow, although a recent case says that, uh, and Tony was informing me that the Court of Appeals uh, is granting uh, uh, the lower, one of the federal district courts to re-examine the whole case because new evidence has come in about the motives of the administration for seeking this question. Um, and the reason it's important is that some states and some people feel that the allocation of seats for the Congress or even for the states should only be determined on the number of citizens and not just the number of people. And some jurisdictions and some political thought uh, says that not only should it be just citizens, but only voters or voting age or registered voters. That will, quite frankly, tend to favor um, Republican areas, rural areas, and white populations. Uh, because we know that there are more undocumented or even immigrants that have been here for 15, 20 years who are not US citizens. And those immigrant communities primarily are in the urban areas. And those urban areas are primarily 
in uh, democratic states. So the citizenship question uh, will probably impact representation in states like California, Texas, even though it's a Republican state, New York, New Jersey, uh, and a few others. The ones that would benefit and get more political representation, more seats in Congress, uh, would be the Midwestern states, uh, and then in Montana and some of the and some of the rural states. So there's a lot at stake over the inclusion of this citizenship question. Now, some people say, well, of course we should know how many citizens there are in the United States. That's very useful information. Well, we do get that information. The, the Commerce Department uh, sends out a survey every single year of to several million households every single year, and that citizenship question is part of that survey. So we are able to get it. We have not had a citizenship question on the decennial census the last one was in 1950. There has not been a citizenship question in the uh, decennial census in 1960, 1970, 1980, 1990, 2000, or 2010. Uh, so um, we're anxiously awaiting uh, the Supreme Court decision, and there's some thought that even if the Supreme Court says it's allowable, uh, the new litigation uh, will try to probe into um, the uh, mentality of the Department of Commerce and the administration for including that uh, because there was in fact uh, information uncovered about a statistician named Hoffeler uh, who specifically said that including a citizenship question would definitely benefit non-Hispanic white populations and Republican areas uh, and especially if we want to eventually move to using citizenship in determining political empowerment instead of just the number of people uh, in a community. And tell us a little bit more about what you learned in 2010 and then the frame of this perfect storm of factors uh, now that, uh, that inform you about how we can make sure that we're appreciating the, the real fear that, that communities face when it comes to this. There, there are community leaders in the room who understand this better than many of us, but uh, as the chair of the Complete Count Committee, what what's what's uh, what can you tell us to really uh, help those of us who don't live with that particular fear? Uh, that is good context on how we should be appreciative of the real uh, the real chance that that could just cause a, a radical undercount and then hurt the communities that we're trying to to support. Well, the Urban Institute has said that uh, the inclusion of this uh, citizenship question would uh, uh, dramatically impact. Uh, the Hispanic Latino community uh, and uh, would uh, we would see undercounting like we've never seen before. There was always going to be an undercount in a, in a census and also an overcount. And so when we seek accuracy, we want to make sure we minimize the overcounts and the undercounts. How do you have an undercount? Well, obviously, if you have homeless people and you're not able to survey them, you have an undercount. Um, if people don't turn in their survey, you have an undercount. Now, then we send people going door to door. But if they don't answer the door, and after four or five times, we'll uh, we send people next door and say, well, how many people are living next door? Well, maybe the next door neighbor doesn't know exactly how many people are living next door. Uh, or, or even if you have a, a survey, we miss the people who are kind of like a tenant in the in the now accessory units or mother-in-law apartments or you know a cottage in the back. So we may miss people. Uh, how do we have an overcount? Well, some people might have a home here in Seattle, but also have a vacation home, let's say, in Palm Desert or Arizona. Well, you get a survey mailed to every residential unit. So let's say uh, John answers the survey delivered to Seattle and spouse Mary answers the survey delivered to their vacation home. So now you've had the family fill it out twice. Or the family says, oh, Johnny's at, uh, at um, University of Colorado, and so I'm going to fill out the form because he's part of the household, and so we included him. But then Johnny gets a form or decides to fill out a form and includes himself. So now we've got Johnny counted twice. So we always want, always want to make sure we don't have an overcount or an undercount. And then we try to clean up some of the messes and, and some of the discrepancies and try to all sort it out. The problem is that we have a lot of populations who never trust government, who are turned off by government. And even if they're not, even if they're here legally, like African-American community in the year 2010, we had about a 2% undercount of African-American community. 
we had a one and a half percent undercount of the Hispanic Latino community for a total of about uh, um, uh, two million people undercounted between the two populations. We had a 5% undercount in the Native American population because they just don't really trust Washington, D.C., have no use for Washington, D.C. They've been victimized and, and uh, discriminated against uh, and uh, uh, have been so mistreated by uh, the U.S. government all, uh, over hundreds of years. They have no use for the census. So um, that's what we faced. And even under Obama's administration, the fear in the Latino community was that, especially if someone came knocking door to door, they might look over your shoulder and look around and maybe that census taker who's a volunteer, oftentimes a retired person, a senior citizen or whatever, or just a person who really cares about government, might report to the local police department or immigration authorities. I think that family is illegal. So people are really afraid to answer the door or even to fill out the form, even though there was no citizenship question involved in the 2010 census. They just don't trust the government. Um, the 2010 census was the most accurate in history. We actually had an overcount of about 36,000 people. Uh, it turned out uh, with all of our adjustments and everything, we had an overcount um, and it was 0.01% of the population was overcounted. That was a 50 times improvement over the overcount of the year 2000 and it was about 300 times better than the undercount of 1990. So we've really gotten it much better. But here's the problem, even though we go around correcting and making adjustments, uh, taking out some of the, and, and you know, we figure out, okay, this person didn't answer the door, but we think it's five people living in that home. We check some other records. No, we correct it. We make it six people. All right, so we, go, we have all these different ways of trying to correct the information that we, that we gather. Statistical sampling, double sampling, knocking on the doors one more time, even if we got it by mail, just verifying what was sent back in. And then they, they uh, basically extrapolate all that. The problem though is that while we can give an official count of the population of America, if we had an undercount of different populations, that cannot be adjusted for political reapportionment representation purposes. So yes, we had an undercount of the Latino Hispanic community of one and a half percent. We had an undercount of almost 2% of the African American community and about a 5% undercount for Native Americans. Those undercounts stuck were used in figuring out how many seats in Congress each community got. Those were the figures used by the states in deciding how many seats in the state legislature and how to draw those boundaries. Those by law cannot be corrected with statistical sampling and verification methods. It is what it is and you're stuck with it. So for in terms of political empowerment, it's very, very important that we get it right the first time. So Governor, we're uh, late June, 2019, and you are the chair of the Complete Count Committee. Uh, you and I were at a meeting yesterday uh, trying to make sure that we've got everything lined up and that we're addressing where our gaps are. How would you assess our readiness right now in Washington State? What, what would you uh, call us to action around in terms of closing those gaps? I think we're just in the beginning stages. Um, uh, the real work has to be done at the grassroots level. Uh, no amount of exhortation, uh, call to action by government leaders uh, will suffice because we're government. Uh, people respond to trusted voices that they work with and interact with on a daily basis. So it's gonna be faith-based leaders. The religious community, the faith-based organizations are key the human service organizations that people use on a daily basis, or whether it's job training or food banks or language uh, uh, assistance, uh, you know, whatever. You know, it's the ACRSs of the world. It's the Fremont Public Development Associations of the world. It's all these different associations and organizations that people deal with, ha have worked with you for years and rely on, uh, have some sort of history with, um, and, who, and, and whose leaders are known 
and whose staff are known to them. Uh, they're the ones who are the most pers persuasive. Uh, when I came in as Secretary of Commerce, it was uh, actually the first day of April, I believe. Yeah, I think it was April 1. And I went straight from the airport, showered and shaved somewhere. But before going to my office, never been to the Commerce Department office before uh, during all those proceedings, but uh, in confirmation proceedings. Went, but as soon as I got off the airplane, showered and shaved, went straight to a census event. Um, and so President Obama, when he came into office and when I took over as Commerce Secretary, we did not even have a census director yet. And so uh, we did not have one on board until about two months later and I was interviewing people uh, and uh, then su submitting a name eventually to the White House. Um, so we were a little bit behind and the, uh, uh, all the different federal watchdog agencies, Congressional Budget Office, General Accounting Agencies all said that the 2010 census was the largest at-risk project facing the Obama administration. So we had to really scramble to really get it on track and to get it up and running. Um, and uh, um, so, but the key then was going out across the country and in this particular case for our state and for our county is meeting with all the different heads of human service organization, religious-based organizations, philanthropic organizations, media, businesses, and so forth and labor because we've got to get the message out. Number one, that the 2020 census is coming. Number two, we need everybody to be counted. Be counted and, uh, and, and to inform people of the benefits that would flow. So getting consistent information, easy to understand information to everybody um, and um, uh, discussing and meeting together to find out where they are, what problems they're encountering, sharing best practices, one nonprofit sh uh, sharing information with an another nonprofit, one religious group or a group of religious leaders sharing information about you know, what works from the pulpit, what doesn't work. That's so incredibly important. Now, the, in 2010, I understand that there was an online option, but in 2020, there's, a, there's a, an effort to target as much as 80% of the responses via online. How do you see this shift? What, what, what's the upside? What's the downside? How do we navigate that? Uh, in 2010, we did not have an online option. And a lot of people say, well, why, why don't you just send, instead of mailing out the, the form to everybody, uh, just you know, make it available online? Well, the problem we had then is that uh, um, people have multiple email addresses. You know, I, I have about three or four email addresses. So if we bombard everybody with email address, all the email addresses, households may end up, you know, mom, dad, you know, all the kids, you could end up with 20 forms. So what's gonna happen is that they're gonna mail the forms to every house, household, every location, every residential unit. And right now that's what they're doing. The, the census is sending out tons of people just verifying addresses. And they're constantly trying to verify addresses because we, we need to know where to send it. But with all the new construction going on, how do we keep abreast? So we depend on the cities and the towns to supply that information. We actually go send out people to verify that the building is still there. It hasn't been torn down. Uh, it's a very labor intensive uh, effort. But nonetheless, we will eventually send out the form and we will encourage people using a, a code so that it represents one household to respond online. You can also mail it back and you can actually call it in as well, right? So we're really trying to um, save on postage because the problem is that in today's technology, people do things online. The reality also is that people don't respond to surveys. You get all these surveys in the mail, um, uh, you know, you bought a new car. Do you like the service? Or you had your refrigerator or your appliance repaired? How was it? You know, just all these surveys of the hotel, the vacation you took, people just put it in the recycling bin, all right? People don't respond. And that's what we faced in 2010. We've had a decade long decline of mail back responses uh, to, the, to the census. And therefore we have to hire more people to go knocking door to door. The more that we can get people to mail it back, or in this case, send it back online or call, the Census Bureau does not have to send people counting uh, places door to door. The census, quite frankly, this year is underfunded. Uh, now, maybe it's because they, they, they were looking at the, how well we did, and then uh, the administration says, okay, we'll give 75% of what Locke was able to spend in 2010. We did such a great job in getting people to respond by mailing it back we, we use fewer people 
going door to door and, and some other efficiencies that we're able to uh, implement, we came in 20% under budget for a savings of $2 billion. Wow. So, um, you know, and it was the most accurate census in several decades, most accurate census in several decades. So we're very, very proud of that. But unfortunately, we're being used, that, that figure now is using as the baseline, the budget. And then if you make us, you know, 15, 20% cut off of that, then uh, that could be problematic. And you led one of the big shifts in how the census is, is done with the short form of 10 questions and then the, the American Community Survey following that. Tell us a little bit about that approach. Well, uh, actually, the, the census uh, used to be, you know, 50, 60 questions. Uh, now, everybody, as far back as 1950, the last time they had a citizenship question, there was technically basically like about 10 or 15, 10 questions that was asked of everybody. And then about another 20, 25% of the population would get a long survey. And it was long. It asked like, what type of heating do you use in your home? Is it coal? Is it gas? Is it electricity? Uh, whatever. Um, uh, and they had all these questions. Uh, what type of job do you have? What education do you have? Uh, where were you born? Are you a naturalized citizen? Uh, 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 how do you get to work, et cetera, et cetera? Uh, really, uh, how, many ch uh, how many children, uh, for the women in the household, how many children have they given birth to? Uh, uh, all kinds of questions. And um, level of education, all kinds of stuff. That type of long survey, even though it only went to, let's say, 25% of the population, was discouraging people from even turning it in or filling it out. So back in actually 1990 is when the Congress urged the Census Bureau to come up with an alternative method of getting all this demographic information, which is really useful for demographers, for businesses and locating businesses and just urban planners and everybody else and government officials knowing the makeup of your community. <laughs> the census takes a long time. They don't do things overnight. So even though the Congress asked them in 1990, after the 1990 census, to come up with a new method of get away from this long form and just have a super short form for the basic questions, it wasn't, they took them, they didn't come up with something until almost uh, 2000 but then they wanted to test it, and they tested for several years. So they finally finalized it in 2005. I mean, 1990, 2005, government moves slowly. Uh, and um, so that's when we have the American survey. And the American survey goes out to about 3 million households, which really covers about 9 million people every single year, in which all these questions are asked. And they're still asking you, what type of heat do you use in your home? Uh, uh, how many days did you go to work? How did you get to work? If it was by car, how many people in the car with you? How long did it take for you to get from your house to work? I mean, they're asking all kinds of questions. And in that American survey, they are also asking the citizenship question. So we're able to get that information, which is why when the Justice Department says this was necessary to help enforce the Voting Rights Act, baloney because the Commerce Department gives them that information every single year, all right? And in fact, the truth of the matter is that Commerce Secretary Ross asked the Justice Department to turn around and ask him to put the question in the 2020 census. And he was asked to do that by members of the administration as all the information now comes out from some of these demographers, this guy named Hoffler, who was really pushing to have a citizenship question in the 2020 census so that the states could eventually use only citizenship to determine apportionment or allocation of seats in Congress or state legislatures. I'm sure you thought about this in, in 2010, but what, what is it that, um, what's the perspective in terms of the cyber threat right now? A lot of things have happened in the last decade around uh, how the digital infrastructure can be uh, affected and, and the impact on our country. Uh, what's your perspective on that today versus 2010 and, and how should we think about data integrity and the use of all this information? Well, with all the evidence and information about uh, hacking by the Russians, 
uh, and actually uh, a, a, a verified story that they were actually able to hack into one of the voting systems of one of the states in the South, or I think Florida or something like that, even though we don't have any evidence that the vote tallies were in any way changed. Um, the more that government does things online, there's always that increased risk of, of uh, uh, hacking uh, by w whether in, you know, a teenager or a foreign government uh, or, or someone with a political agenda. So uh, I don't know how well the system is being uh, protected or um, what the safeguards are. I know it's always been a concern uh, about uh, uh, using online methods uh, when, when we were t even talking about it in 2010. And do you think it's a real concern or sort of a ghost ship that at, in the current environment, uh, the information could be utilized by other departments of government or by law enforcement in ways that are not envisioned right now? How, how strong is the law around the use of the information from the census? That, that's always been a fear, and that was a fear uh, in 2010. And uh, we had specific assurances and memos written by the U.S. Attorney General, uh, Eric Holder at the time, reaffirming the privacy of that data uh, and that uh, uh, it would be held sacrosanct. And there are various laws uh, on the books that, that say that it's all private for the next 75 years. We can get raw data. I mean, we get the demographic data. We compile it all. You know, how many uh, people of different ethnic origins or how many with, uh, with college degrees living in this area and down to the census track data neighborhood level. But privacy, there's no revelation of names and so forth. And it has to be kept confidential for 75 years. So if a researcher wants to see what Gary Locke d said on his uh, 2010 or 2020 census, they can see it 75 years from now. But in the meantime, no government agency has access to it. And it's a law, it's a violation, it's a, crim a crime if any census worker ever reveals that information, whether it's the people going door to door or the people working for the Department of Census to in any way give out that private personal information. There's still, of course, distrust of government. Um, can they use the Patriot Act somehow to override some of these uh, uh, congressionally passed laws? Um, what's to stop a person somehow from just knocking on the door, looking at the household and reporting it to uh, customs and, and border patrol? So that's the fear. That is the fear. That's been a fear for several decades, which is, and then just the mistrust of government. Um, and, uh, and with, you know, undercounting uh, non-participation by Native Americans, African Americans, and of course with the uh, um, uh, Muslims under the gun and under the under the uh, you know being victimized and vilified by the administration or some in the administration and certainly um, those who are not here legally, uh, people are very very afraid. So I'm going to ask the governor one more question, but I encourage you to get your questions ready. We have some time for uh, for Q and A from the audience. You know, Governor, we we could hear about the citizenship question as early as tomorrow morning. Uh, we're on the brink of that. Uh, there are things that we would do as a result of that answer one way or another. But what's your, what's your uh, challenge to the, to the people in the room, both representing institutions, companies, individuals, families? What can we all do right now to make sure that this is uh, done as well as possible? Well, we just need to reinforce the message that everyone needs to be counted. It's in our political self-interest. It's in our financial self-interest. It's in, it's in our self-interest in terms of the strength of our community to make sure that we have the dollars that, 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 des that we deserve coming for the programs that we care about most, whether it's senior housing, whether it's nutrition programs and school lunch programs, to highway construction, et cetera, et cetera, uh, or for homelessness. Uh, so this is our money. We need to make sure that we get our fair share of it. And of course, if we want our issues addressed in the United States Congress, if, if the things that we care about uh, are to be dealt with in the Congress or in the halls of Olympia, we need to make sure that we are represented, that we have our fair share of our, that our voices are heard. And so if we have large segments of the community not counted, then we will not get our fair share of legislative districts. Let's say, you know, the, the legislative district, uh, we get one legislator for an area that really should have had two people uh, because we were undercounting 
uh, our, ourselves. And so uh, regardless of how you feel about these issues, uh, we need to make sure that we are counted so that we have the political voice and representatives who will then hopefully take our concerns and our issues, our fears, anxieties, our hopes and dreams, whether to Olympia or to, um, uh, or to uh, uh, Washington, D.C. In 2010, we had calls for boycotts of the entire census, not just one or two questions, but the entire census. We had uh, people from the Tea Party and others saying, don't answer the census, don't participate at all. It's a violation of your civil rights and civil liberties and your privacy. Um, then we also had the Latino Hispanic community calling for a boycott of the entire census until they got full legal, uh, uh, until f there was full immigration reform. And we said, well, wait a second. We were trying to uh, counter that by saying, in order to get immigration reform, however you define it, uh, whatever your viewpoint is, you have to have a political voice. And so the more political voices you have in the Congress, um, the more you're apt to get the issue discussed and dealt with in the United States Congress. But if you are completely undercounted, then you're actually shooting yourselves in the foot and not gaining in political representation. Uh, so we, uh, we had Michelle Bachman, uh, Congresswoman from Minnesota calling for that boycott. But like I said, we had the Latino community calling for a boycott. So we actually put together a public service announcement with Carl Rove, who used to work for uh, President George W. Bush, a uh, very conservative uh, Republican, uh, doing public service announcements with a liberal Democrat. And we had people of the Latino community, African American community, Native American community doing public service announcements. Um, and we said, hey, you know, the, the, the 2010 census is almost identical to the very, cent very first cens census in 1790 under George Washington. In fact, we said it's, and, and Karl Rove and, and others uh, were saying, it's your constitutional responsibility, in fact, to participate in the census. You know, the, the, the only, you know, the, the, the 1790 census had questions like, uh, well, I have it here, but um, basically it was, name of the people in the household, the number of free women, the number of free males, and how many slaves do you have? Now notice we talk about the citizenship question. Even back in 1790, they were asking for the people who are not US citizens or not who cannot even vote. Women were not allowed to vote. So this, this movement to say that the census should be collecting information of only voters to be used in drawing up congressional seats and figuring out how many members of Congress the state of Washington or Iowa or Montana should get. It doesn't make sense to say it should only be based on the number of voters, citizen voters or even, you know, uh, or citizens or non-citizens or even registered voters. Why? Because women were not allowed to vote in 1790, and yet we were counting them. Slaves were not even considered citizens in 1790, and yet we were counting them. Although we only, for every five slaves, we only treated them as three, the equivalent of three white males. And then people were, and in some states, in the early colonies, people could only vote if they owned land. All right, so this notion that, uh, uh, the census should only count citizens or only count people eligible to vote is, is, is the farthest from the truth and, and farthest from the history of, of America. Because we had so many populations in 1790 who were not eligible to vote either because they did not land, own land, were not, or they were women, or they were slaves. And so um, 1790, it was to count everybody living in the community in the country, period. And so that's why we need to make sure that, uh, w that's why we have so many concerns about this inclusion of the citizenship question uh, suddenly in the year 2020, when in fact the Commerce Department collects that information using different surveys. And so it's not necessary to put it in the 2020 census. And we know uh, from uh, even the Census Bureau professionals themselves that the inclusion of the citizenship question will depress the, the response. That's from the Census Bureau professionals themselves, not the political, but the career people who are arguing and who are arguing against the inclusion of that question, but they were overridden uh, by the political powers above them.
I think we do have the laws in place and I, I would hope that the United States Congress and the various committees in the House and the Senate will continue to hold hearings uh, to get those firm declarative statements from the administration uh, that uh, the results will be kept private. And of course, you know, if people are afraid that someone's going to come knocking on your door and looking at your household and checking you out and maybe reporting you to immigration and et cetera, et cetera, the best way to do that is to avoid having them ever come to your house, submit the, the answers online or by mail or by telephone. That way you avoid people coming to your house. Uh, and uh, so um, I, I, I have absolute confidence in the career people in, in the Census Bureau that the information will be protected. Uh, we need to make sure that the uh, Justice Department, uh, we get statements from the Justice Department. I think there will be time over time, over the next several months, we have a, almost a year uh, or 10 months before the census uh, is rolled out. Uh, plenty of time to get those statements and affirmations uh, by uh, administration of people. The more that the people helping conduct the census reflect the, the makeup of the community that's being surveyed, the more successful that census is. So the census, uh, department or the offices now are really trying to recruit people uh, uh, that would mirror the targeted communities, um, uh, whether it's Hispanic, Asian, uh, Native American, African American, uh, especially the ones that go door to door. But even the staff uh, that, are, uh, that are being hired now to work with community groups they're really trying to push that diversity so that uh, the community groups will feel more comfortable as well. Um, it's always hard. It's always a, a problem. And right now, the census is behind schedule in their hiring of people. Uh, they're not going to be hiring as many people as they did in 2010. Um, and the few that, or the, the numbers that they are targeting, they're already behind because it also requires, everyone has to go through an FBI check, a criminal background check. We want to make sure that, you know, we're not having child molesters and criminals going door to door. Uh, and so, um, even in 2010, uh, there was a, a, a backlog of getting those through, but we were able to then uh, get the Justice Department, the FBI to really hasten that. I don't know if there's that much sense of urgency uh, with this administration on that process right now, but there is a backlog of getting people, even after they've been offered a job of getting them placed because they haven't yet cleared the background check. The city of Seattle and working with nonprofit organizations in the Census Bureau, uh, Census folks, I think have done a fairly good job in the past of canvassing the homeless. Now, you can't, uh, can't go around saying we caught every single person, know exactly where someone is staying, but they actually have, working with the human service agencies, um, they've identified, they picked specific dates to actually go out and do that hand count. The ultimate goal is, I think, for those who want that question, is to say that for the deciding how many seats in Congress a state gets, we will only count the number of actual naturalized citizens or, yeah, citizens, period. Which could mean that the state of Washington would lose one seat. Because I, you know, I, I, I know so many people in the Chinese community that have been here for 20, 30 years, uh, never, you know, they're all green card holders, they're permanent residents, paying taxes, but have decided not to get us, become a U.S. citizen. Or let's say they, some people I know from a church, they're Canadian citizens and want to keep their Canadian citizenship, but have never become a U.S. citizen, but have lived here for 50 years. So um, uh, it's not going to say, are you here legally or illegally? It just says, are you a citizen or not a U.S. citizen? But the fear is that for some people, among some groups is that, oh, if I say I'm not a US citizen, does that mean someone will come knocking on my door to ask, are you here legally or illegally? So there's that, there's where the fear factor comes in. We've always targeted the schools and the schools are very much involved, the superintendent of public instruction and the various school districts are very much involved in the state effort, uh, the county effort, uh, and not just the public schools, but also the colleges, universities. And we in Washington DC in 2010, really focused on uh, making sure there were educational materials that the teachers could uh, use that will be available I'm, I'm pretty sure available online suggested curriculum templates and things like that and it's a great time to really talk about history our u.s constitution and and how our country was founded and so it's a good civic lesson but you're right those who school kids can go back home and say hey mom dad we're supposed to fill this out we got to send it back in or here's an email address and and uh you know, we'll, we'll um, and they'll, they'll do all the translation and they oftentimes they're the ones, the kids are the ones who, 
who uh, submit the form. Uh, in terms of uh, Native American populations, we've, uh, I, you know, I can't speak about this current administration. I can only tell you that in 2010, we, we really targeted uh, the Native American populations and um, uh, worked with the tribes uh, to pay people to go you know, collect that information and making sure that we had those paid enumerators. Enumerators are the ones that go door to door, uh, that we really uh, staffed up and really uh, devoted attention to that particular uh, population. You know, I, I was trying to look back in the history of, of the census. I didn't realize that um, it wasn't until recently that we even had mail back. 1970 was the first time you could, well, starting with 1950 and earlier, the census was collected only by people going door to door. All right? The form was never even mailed to you. The count was only done by people who were hired by the US government to go knocking door to door. And then in 1960 was the first time they actually mailed out the form to the household, but you did not send it back in. You had to wait until someone came knocking on your door to turn it in, all right? And then there was, 20% of the population got a really long survey and, 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 um, uh, and they either mailed that back in or they had to give that to the, to the enumerator. And it was not until 1970 was the first year that you not only received it in the mail, but that you could also mail it back. So, uh, but uh, ever since then, the mail back response has gone down because people don't like answering or responding to all the surveys they get in the mail, all the junk mail that they get. So there are always questions that are left blank. Some people don't like the, the, uh, uh, the, the race question or they don't feel that it properly identifies their particular ethnic group. And so they skip that question altogether. Um, now in terms of today with, uh, 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 I'm not at hip on the latest term, but with all the different issues of sexual identity uh, some people will be offended by the question or asking you to identify as either male or female. So I'm sure that we'll have some people not answering that question. Um, the Census Bureau will try to send people out or call people because you also give a telephone number to try to, if there's vast amounts of information left blank, they'll try to if they have the resources, they'll try to do that. If it's only one or two questions left blank, I personally doubt that they're gonna go, come door to door to ask you for that information. Now, one person said, well, we should encourage everyone to, to fill in and say you're a citizen, uh, but that would be actually lying. And I don't want people lying and committing a crime by providing false information. <laughs> Skipping information and leaving it incomplete is another matter because the, the census is never 100% complete because, for instance, um, you're not home. You did not fill out the census form. We send someone to your house three times and you're on vacation, you're working, you have a different work schedule or whatever, um, or you're socializing and, and we miss you. So the fourth time we might actually go next door and knock on the neighbor's door and say, okay, who are the people next door? How many people living there? Well, we get a rough count. Maybe we missed one. Do you know their ethnic origin? No, I really don't, all right? Uh, do you know if they're married or not? No, I really don't, you know? Are they citizens or not? I don't really know. But all I know is that I think there are five people living there. And I think there's, you know, three boys and, and two girls or whatever, you know? And, and so we record it. Now, it's not, not the most complete information, but it helps us do the count. And so, um, you know, there's always incomplete information. What we did in 2010, I know, is that we encouraged community groups, church groups to, hey, have a, a census night and everybody bring your census form and uh, we'll help you fill it out. And we do it and, uh, you know, interpret and, and uh, assist you in filling it out. And we'll, we'll take it and we'll, we'll mail it for you. We'll make sure you mail it because a lot of people fill out the form or they leave it lying around and forget to mail it. Right. So um, you know, okay. th those are things that people can okay. do. The what census uh, uh, will come out in basically March and there'll be a lot of publicity going in fe late February. And in March, households, early March, the households will receive the forms and we really want you to f uh, f 
submit the information, whether by email, by mail, or by telephone, by about the third week of March. If, uh, I'm, I'm thinking back to 2010. And then after, uh, after that, we stop. We don't urge you to send it back anymore. We go quiet because we want all the forms to come in. And then we start figuring out which addresses did not send back the forms. We then put together a huge list and that's when we send people to go out door to door. And that starts around April 1 uh, is the door to door campaign. Various groups will be seeking funding to help implement and carry out the census. Uh, but the Congress typically just puts one lump sum into the Commerce Department budget and the Census Bureau. And then it's up to the Census Bureau and the Commerce Department to decide how to allocate those funds. So I, I'm not sure. Um, I'm a little bit wary that the library association or any association would be able to get a line item uh, of funds dedicated just to them, earmarked for them to help with the census. Uh, but clearly we need those partnerships and I know that at the state level in the complete, complete count committee we are using libraries and focusing on libraries. Any organization to help people fill it out whether it's to mail it back or to, uh, uh, to submit it over the internet. With respect to whether or not you can submit the form, even if you skip a question, I, we were told at one of our early meetings by uh, high-ranking Census Bureau officials that um, s missing a question here or there does not preclude you from hitting the submit or send button. So we'll, uh, I'll follow up on that, thank you. Well, uh, Governor uh, Inslee has put together a complete count committee and the Census Bureau is encouraging all communities to have what they call complete count committees. Really citizen groups, citizen organizations uh, and government private sector and philanthropic and, and uh, nonprofit uh, representatives on these complete count committees to really publicize uh, the upcoming 2020 census, uh, to really share information to develop strategies on how to get as high a participation rate as possible, uh, and really just to inform the community about the importance of the census. So the state committee, I actually chair it, and we have people from different government agencies, elected officials, we have the colleges and universities, we have the superintendent of public instruction, we have representatives from the, the Seattle Foundation, philanthropic organizations, refugee committees, uh, uh, different ethnic uh, communities, um, uh, religious community, um, business, labor, uh, and a whole host of different associations who have members who have their own organizations that they can disseminate the information to and uh, uh, to really ensure as, as complete a account as possible. So that, that's looking at it from the state level. Uh, but then we need to make sure that each city or each region is focused on that as well because you know when you're dealing with it at the state level, it's a very high level. Well, what about all the individual organizations in South Seattle or in White Center or up in Ballard area that could help? Well, the state of Washington can't reach all of them, so we're encouraging communities like Seattle, Kirkland, Bellevue, Yakima, Spokane, you know, um, Port Angeles to have or, and, or by counties to have their own complete count committees doing exactly the same thing, but reaching out to the individual organizations. You'll be able to get almost instantaneously uh, by census tract data during that month of March. And so that's how uh, we'll be able to see. So the city of Seattle can say, hey, we're underperforming where we wanna be, or parts of Seattle are underperforming where we would like it to be. And the city and the regional committees and the community groups can respond and target those areas. Uh, that'll be by census track uh, uh, level. Uh, but uh, we will give a report to the president, or we gave a report to President Obama, I think we gave it to him in December of 2010. Because in 2011, I was off to Beijing, so uh, so it was before I left. He's also the so, ambassador to yeah, China, in yeah. case you want to so, ask about so, China. No, but now, now remember, that's just the raw, well, I wouldn't say, it, that is the actual count that includes the undercounts and the overcounts. That is the information and, and, the, and for a congressional apportionment, allocation of seats in Congress, the Census Bureau cannot go back in and correct some of these things. You know, we, we know that there was an overcount because we counted, mom and dad counted son in Seattle, even though son turned in a form because he is at the University of Colorado. So 
We later on find out some of these discrepancies and we correct the count for the total population of America. But we are not allowed by law to correct the count that we give to the president for the purposes of determining how many seats in Congress Washington state gets. So the undercount of Hispanic groups, one and a half percent, the undercount of African American communities, two percent, the undercount of Native Americans, five percent, that has real consequences in terms of allocating seats in Congress. Yes, with our statistical methods, we had the most accurate census in history with a slight overcount of some 39,000 people. But that did not help with respect to the inaccuracies from the door to door, the mail back campaigns, et cetera, et cetera, that were used for determining how many seats states get in the, in the United States Congress. Now here's one other thing that, that all of us should be aware of. And, as, and I, I was just talking today as I did a little bit more research to get my facts correct on the 2010 census. I talked with my director the director of the Census Bureau, uh, Bob uh, Groves, who is now the provost at, uh, uh, at Georgetown University. He and his staff did an incredible job, by the way. But anyway, the citizenship question, how might that affect people? And how might we at the Census Bureau never detect it? You have a household and you fill out the form. And what you do is you, you got two people who are non-citizens or maybe here that are undocumented living in the household. You just report on the form or to the person knocking on the door, the number of people who are here legally. You basically hide the two people that are undocumented uh, that are here, all right? Now, you've turned in the form. As far as the Census Bureau is concerned, case closed, complete count. We have no way of verifying the information later on or sending, we're not going to send anyone door to door because you've submitted the information. So that undercount will be hidden from the professionals at the, at the Census Bureau. That's a fear that the professionals have. Because of the fear of the citizenship question and what it might, uh, uh, what, what could come of it, people might purposely not might purposely report only those who are in the household legally or even just the people with citizenship in the household period, which would lead to a huge undercount of huge populations and the census professionals would never be the wiser. So that's why we need to really figure out what the response, hopefully the Supreme Court will not allow that question or if there's continued court cases, uh, that uh, lower courts will eventually throw out the citizenship question. But if it is, if, but if it remains, communities need to develop a strategy on how to tell people or urge people uh, how to respond. So before I hand over to my colleague Aaron to wrap up, I think that um, you can appreciate what I've come to appreciate in working with Governor Locke that uh, we have an incomparable leader in, uh, in giving us guidance through this and so many other things. And I was hoping everyone would get a Census 101 course today. I think we all got a Census 700 course today. So I, I, uh, I just want to uh, thank you very much for the leadership you're exhibiting and for being here with us today. I appreciate the work of the foundation. Thank you.